This is Rockstar Doctor Life uh, into your conversation <laughs> with Dr. Otto Jenke. <laughs> Whenever I hear the song. You think of me. <laughs> I think of you. Especially that part. <laughs> Hey, listeners, welcome to the show today. I've been laughing already, and I have lots of good memories of uh, sharing some laughs with Dr. Otto Jenke, who is my featured guest today on the show. I first met him at Total Solutions back in 2005. Is that correct, I think Otto? it was five. Might have been and, three. Uh, I think it was five. Yeah, that's when that, that song, you know, that he just played, Rockstar, was the big movie at the time, or one of the movies at the time. And we were up at the wall, you know, that moment at Total, those of you who've been to Total Solutions, where you've got to climb the wall and do all those team building um, activities. And as we're standing there, Otto just belts out, you know, one of the lines from the movie. And I really didn't know him very well at the time, but I looked at him and I'm like, this is a dude I like and I'm going to stay connected with. And uh, he certainly is going to bring a bit of a rock star doctor element to the show when you hear all the things that he's been up to in the, the 26 years he's been in practice. So without saying any more, Otto, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here with me today. Uh, thank you. First of all, I don't think that was me because I'm a big um, Simon and Garfunkel fan and I wouldn't have been singing that song whatsoever. So I think you have the wrong person. I, I must. Yes, you're correct. And there's nothing in your personality that I've seen <laughs> since then um, that would give me any indication. Um, why don't you start off and, and tell some of our listeners, you know, what are, what's life like for you right now as uh, a chiropractor? What are the things you're, where are you practicing? Um, just talk a little bit about the other things you're doing for chiropractic. And, um, and what else have you got going on? Cool. Uh, first of all, a quick 26 years in practice. And I graduated from Paisa Form University, Davenport, Iowa. Excellent. Thank you very much. Excellent. Paisa Form University. Um, I got to tell you, I, uh, people talk about being starting in practice, being in practice and being glad that they got away from the education and the, and the reading. I don't read anymore. I inhale books and articles, podcasts, uh, videos more than I ever did before. And I schedule, I make sure I schedule it into my day to make sure I do that because if you want to be the smartest kid on the block, then you got to start reading as much as possible and you got to find all the different avenues and you have got to, you have got to be able to communicate that well. And I've spent 26 years learning how to communicate chiropractic to other chiropractors uh, other healthcare practitioners and the community. And that is, um, cause I screwed it up tremendously. I screwed it up tremendously early on and, uh, put myself into, oh, almost out of practice, but, um, because I didn't do it correctly, but uh, I did it all the time. And that's, that's, that's my, I just love, love, love that. So when you say, um, you know, you almost screwed it up, what got you rerouted into building the life and practice that you have now? So 26 years have been two times my, in my, in my practice that, um, I almost said goodbye to practice. One was when my parents died, my parents died in 2005. Um, they died six months apart. And I, I got to tell you, quite frankly, I really didn't give a crap much after that. If I had stopped practice, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have cared because my two anchors had, um, had left. Uh, then my dog died after that. And I thought it was me. I thought, quite frankly, I thought it was me. Um, but then uh, before that was frustration of coming out of Palmer, thinking I had lightning in my pisiforms, and then not being able to effectively tell people why they should be adjusted, what the benefit to them was being adjusted. And then I worked for a company that had 50 clinics, and they were very much pain-based, very much pain-based, very much insurance-oriented, and they would run up the bill as much as possible the very first couple of days. And then after the insurance stopped paying, um, they would, how do, how do you convert someone at that time to be in the lifelong cash patient pay? And, the, and the, that company didn't know, they didn't care. And so all of a sudden you're floundering there going, then you have to have that, that whole new patient. You have to get 30, 40, 50 new patients every month. And that's just freaking tiring, man. That's tiring. Um, and so that was, I moved and I came back up, I came to my hometown where I am now. And it, it's, uh, the first couple of years here weren't always that easy also because I had the same mentality and I had to learn that whole stuff. I had to learn the communication, uh, my, why did I want to become a chiropractor? More importantly, what's the benefit for you, Melissa, for being under, under chiropractic care for the rest of your life? And so I had to go find that out and then be able to effectively communicate it. And that, that made practice, um, 
simpler. It wasn't always easy, but it made it simpler. So who would you say were some of your who or programs or, you know, what was your biggest influence at that time that really got your head around? Because let's face it, a lot of docs at all times in practice will have ups and downs and times when they need to get grounded again in their purpose, uh, maybe change their systems, maybe learn some more. And there's tons of great, you know, events and speakers and programs out there that can help us. Was there something that was really pivotal for you that helped you make that shift when you decided to stay engaged in practice? So two things. One is, um, I listened to to Guy Reekman speak on a Saturday morning from the master circle. I had been in the master circle for a while, but he spoke on a Saturday morning. I didn't sleep well that night, the morning, um, that night before. And if I don't sleep well, I'm the the grumpiest, worst kid on the block. And, um, he spoke that morning and I could barely pay attention. But by the time he was done, I walked up to him and gave him my card and said, you're going to need my help promoting chiropractic. And he came out, kind of looked at me like, you know, who the hell are you? I said, I'm Otto Janky. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that a couple of times. I'm Otto Janky. Don't you freaking know who I am? <laughs> no, but well, you will, you will. Um, and so, um, was that, but and I, I don't want this to sound, um, self, grandizing by any means but i gotta tell you it's me kicking my own ass and saying i've been given every skill i've ever needed i've been given massive talents would you freaking use them please and so it was a matter of getting getting my ass out of my own way and saying let's go and here's and here's what i mean by this if you've got a great voice then freaking sing would you please if you can dribble a basketball and you're seven foot tall would you please play in the nba if you can run fast and become an Olympic sprinter, if you've got talent in your hands to help people and you communicate it, then freaking use them. Just freaking use them, please. And so oh, it was that. It was realizing that I've been given gifts and talents the same as you have, same as all your listeners have. You find out what they are and use them. Go freaking use them. And that's that was um, – I'll tell you what happened one time was I was in um, – with the master's circle. We were in Louisville, Kentucky. We're at the Muhammad Ali Center. And the Muhammad Ali Center, you would think, would be a center dedicated only to a, a man's fight in the boxing ring. It was a small part of the boxing ring because it was also a man's fight for social justice, racial equality, and religious freedom. Um, and you walk around, they've got all these quotes by Ali. And this one quote was only by a little card, you know, a little, a little postcard like that. And uh, I looked at it and it said, you've been given gifts and talents by God, and it's your responsibility to use them correctly. And I looked at it and said, that son of a bitch is talking right to me. And I walked away from it, walked around for a little bit, came back to it, walked away, came back to it, walked away, came back to it like the fourth time. So I'm there for an hour, hour and a half. I'm looking at this. I looked, last time I started, started really almost crying about it because I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. And then you start going, okay, this is – this is what I'm really good at. This is what I'm really good at. So stop denying it. Stop trying to do that thing over there or that thing over there. Do this because this is this is easy. Mm-hmm. This is simple. And you're give you know if you if you run fast for you to run you know 100 meters really fast. I I don't. It's difficult for me. But if you run fast, you're like oh yeah. I don't even I don't even think about that because it's easy for me to do. Find your gifts and talents and use them and use and and use them all the time. Life gets fun. Yeah, so, and I 100% agree, you know, I'm putting together a talk that I'm giving shortly, and, and that was one of the things for me, it's like, you got to get to know who you are, and then, you know, figure out your zone of genius, figure out what you're good at, and then try to build a life that allows you to do more of that and less of the things that you hate, right? And, and in chiropractic, especially. But for you, when you think about that, you know, if there was someone, one thing you could say to people who are listening that might be like, yeah, that's how I feel. How would you recommend people go about figuring out what they're good at, you know, within chiropractic, within their life in general? Is there a one like sort of suggestion or one thing that really helped you during that time? I know it sounds like it was just an emotional, powerful moment for you, but is there a way that people can cultivate that? So that's a great question. So um, I was always the kid in grade school, like when you're in first and second grade, when you had show and tell. I got up in front of show and tell every day. I raised my hand. I would make shit up when I was talking to show and tell. I went on first grade and make a, oh, yeah, there was a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A three-headed monster came in my bedroom last night. And uh, I was, you know, it's just, so I got up. I was, I had no problem getting up in front of people speaking. So that was never a problem for me. It's not that I don't get nervous doing this, though. It's just that right now in my in in my life, it's, 
it's either I can be nervous going on stage or be nervous, you know, not paying my bills. And, you know, and that happened. And so, so the easiest way to find out what you're really good at is ask your friends, ask your friends and family. Mm -hmm. And you, sometimes you ask them and you just send them, it's like, Melissa, would you do me a big favor? What do you think my biggest talents are? I said, I'm just trying to really find out about myself and find out what I'm really good at. And could you just tell me, what do you think I'm really good at? And your friends will rip off three, four, five things immediately. And you'll say, oh, really? And there'll be a commonality to that. There'll be a commonality to that. And they'll say, dude, you are freaking awesome at that. And it's going to be something that you think is so simple and so easy because that's your talent. That's your, that's, as you said, that's your zone of genius. And, but you've, you've denied that because you think it's simple. You think that your talent should be something that you have to work your freaking your heart at. No, no, no. Your talent is what's God given to you. It's a gift to you. How you use that is the work afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What always comes to mind is this uh, quote that I think about from Simon Sinek. I, I like a lot of his, his books. Um, work, is, work is expending effort on things we don't want to do. Passion is expending energy on things we love to do. The goal is to do no work. <laughs> right because yeah. when you're doing things that Absolutely. excite you and you feel that they're aligned with your purpose and your talents then it doesn't nothing else seems like an effort i mean sometimes people ask me how do you do the podcast and this and all these things that you're doing and like it doesn't feel stressful to me it feels freaking fun i get to have these really awesome conversations with people and uh and learn from each person and um and i have a lot of fun doing it so i think that's really great that you shared that with listeners i think that's a really great tip now anyone listening could obviously hear that you are fired up you know, you've got a lot of energy, a lot of passion for what you're doing. So what keeps you so fired up about chiropractic and what you're doing? Um, you know, I don't really need something to fire me up about it, to tell you the truth. Okay. It's like I don't need to, I don't need to, um, I don't need to be in love. It's just, it's just, that's what it is. I, I, I love, I love chiropractic. I love the idea of chiropractic. I love how great people can be when they're adjusted. I love when the person tells me last week that she's 60 something years old and she no longer takes her anxiety medication, although I had never understood, she never told me she had anxiety. I love when the woman who tells me last week that um, uh, this last winter was the best winter she ever had because she wasn't sick. And, and, and all these people, they tell you these things and you're like, you're like, hells yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. When a body rocks, a body freaking rocks. And, and then you see all that. And, and, um, every day I book out a minimum of 45 minutes a day just to look up research and read on chiropractic and how the body can be better and how you can be better by being under my chiropractic care. And so I do it every single day and it drives me every single freaking day and I go speak all over the freaking place. But it's just, I love talking about that. And when you tell that story, when you tell the story of chiropractic, um, people get it and they go, holy crap, where have you guys been my whole life? Mm -hmm. And is that what prompted you, your love of research and reading and learning, um, is that what prompted you to start a Cairo Rising? Um, two things. One, one is... Um, I think there needs to be someplace in chiropractic which says, screw you, I'm not doing low back pain anymore. I think if, if you think people, so I, I had this discussion with, um, where was I last weekend? I was at our state convention last weekend. And someone would ask me, what do you talk about? So, I, so here's some business stuff. I, I pre-qualify every person who calls into my office who wants to become a new patient. So I get on the phone with them sometime and I say, Hi, Melissa. This is Dr. Otto Janke. How can I be of service to you? Oh, hi, Doc. I'm, I'm talking, you know, I got this going. And so I pre qualify everybody. And I tell everybody that we recommend a minimum of one year of care for you. And I hear, I can hear some of your listeners right now going, What? How can that's what I recommend? And here's the reality How long do you think people should be adjusted? And everybody I talk to says, I think people should be adjusted for life. Well, if, the, if you firmly believe that, are you giving them that idea of, to be adjusted for life? Like, and some people will say to me, well, how about we start off with, no, you told me, you just told me that you think people should be adjusted for life, but then you're going to sacrifice, you're going to minimize how great you can be with them because you're afraid. And you know, the, the orthodontist has no problem telling people it's going to be three to five years of braces. 
your trainer is going to tell you, not, not afraid to tell you whatsoever, that's going to be six months, 12 months for you to lose those 20 pounds, 30 pounds to get in great shape. Um, all these other people have no problem telling you that same stuff. But we as chiropractors, we're going to talk about the one profession which has the strongest backbone. Man, we are just wimps on that. And we get so afraid of that. So I stopped being afraid of that. I started telling people the freaking truth on this. And I need to find some people. Uh, I want to find the research all the time that, that backs it up. It says, you are just so much better by being adjusted for life. You're just so much better. And that's why I did that. So you started it basically as a resource for yourself, but then now it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a Facebook page, I believe, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, where uh, docs can you're go and, and see, you know, you're interviewing people, you're posting research, they can go and get uh, inspired and engaged and get, get more certain on the effects of their adjustments. Absolutely. I'm, st I'm talking with that young lady today who's a young doc who was, you know, eight months into in practice um, and she didn't know what to say. And she didn't know what, what the references were. And it's not that you need research all the time, but I highly recommend you have research behind you. Uh, read everything. And I don't read just chiropractic stuff. I mean, I, I wish I could show you the – I mean, I, I read this book over, you know, How the Immune System Works, uh, at fourth edition. It's a, small, it's a small book, but it's like, huh, I, I forgot I knew that. And I read – and so I go also read the uh, – the neuro neurology diplomates. I go, I go, I don't take the diplomate, but I go get their books and I read their books over the winters. That's why I love winters in upstate New York. Cause you can be on. <laughs> um, so I, 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 yeah, I, I can stay inside and I just devour that stuff. But I do that because I want you, Melissa, to understand how great you can be. I, it's not, a, it's not for me because that, that information is totally freaking useless. It's useless if you are unable to communicate how great you can be, Melissa, under consistent chiropractic care. And so I want you to understand that you know, when your child's born, that the opportunity for subluxation is there. I want you to understand that by the, you know, and, and I want you to understand and being able to easily communicate that, that is, that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're helping a lot of other docs with that, with that whole page. And, and you're also doing a podcast, um, Mad Health, right? The Mad, Mad Health podcast. Um, you know, what's kind of funny is I want to start interviewing, uh, rock stars and understand, you know, you are talking, you and I were talking before about the <laughs> rock star lifestyle and being on the road and the number of rock stars who lives are toast, just absolutely toast. And so when I read, this is what I read on, I read, um, right now I've got Brendan Burchard's book. I've got, uh, the synergist by Les McCown. Les McCown's got great stuff. I've got the immune system, uh, book. Um, I've got one by, I got the China study by T. Colin Campbell, who's speaking for me in September, and I've got Jay Abraham's book. Um, I read those books, but then I also read really druggy, hoary rock and roll stories because I love that <laughs> stuff too, to balance everything out. And so I want to interview, uh, you know, the guy who was the guitarist for the Sex Pistols and the guy who was the singer for uh, The Alarm and just go like, what's, what's your health like? And, and understand that whole stuff because that's... You, know, you and I are talking. It's just a whole different lifestyle. It just burns you out so quickly. Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of glamour, obviously, attached to it. But anyone that I've spoken with that's been in the business uh, has told me lots of other stories that are uh, physically and emotionally, you know, really unhealthy. But um, you know, so you it's get hard. yeah, you get and you have your own personal, you know, fun with being a musician and and having some fun on the side and. You know, what keeps you, um, what do you do for fun outside of practice? I know you're reading, you've got a, you know, the band, you've got your dogs, but you know, to keep yourself grounded and healthy and whole and happy to be in the practice every day and to speak and to research, do you have other things that you do for auto? Um, yes. So we, we have, now we have uh, springtime in central New York. So I will be out. So I love going out and just walking. I love to walk. Mm -hmm. And so even on New Year's Eve, it was eight degrees. I had great dinner with my brother and his wife. And then I went for, I got bundled up and went for a walk, eight degrees. And it was freaking awesome. I put on my, put on my pod, uh, iPod and, and went for a walk. And it was just, it was awesome. Just playing some great music, walking around and no one was out because everybody's partying and stuff. So it was like eight, nine o'clock at night. No one's out. So it was, it was freaking awesome. So I go for walks all the time. I love nature. Um, love going to watch bands play, watch bands play all the time. Um, uh, but 
just meeting people, just getting out and just talking with people. That's uh, it's funny because I'm a very social person in practice, but I'm a very um, solitary person when I'm home. You need to recharge. Right. I need to recharge because I'm all day long. It was funny because I had one of our practice members yesterday said, Dr. Jenke always seems to be he's so happy in practice. And, and my first answer to that is, well, thank you very much. But second of all is, why would you ever want to go to some sorry mope who's always around going, oh, oh man, practice. I would never do that to my practice members because my energy is what helps you get helps you to heal. Yeah. Um, and so I would never be that doctor who says, oh, yeah, life just, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I never talk about insurance companies and stuff. You know, I never, I never talk about any of that stuff. Even when, even when we've had some terrible things happen in our, in our communities or something, I never, you know, we just, we just be quiet and let the energy work even better. And it, it's, you know, it's a funny thing about that is I used to never talk that way when I first started practicing until you realize that it's, you have to talk about um, love, loving people in the practice and uh, giving energy, positive energy to people. It's, it's kind of funny how you're, how things change in practice. Well, and I liked what I was reading your bio, <laughs> the shortest bio that anyone has ever sent me, by the way. Um, You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and you said, in my 26 year of practice, I'm finally finding out what I'm supposed to do and who I am. It's about time, isn't it? So tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, because a lot of people maybe are, you know, um, practice for 10 years, 15 years, five years, and struggling, maybe making things more complicated than they need to be, or maybe just um, struggling in another way personally. Can you share any more light on on some of the things that have helped you figure yourself out and then help your practice and, and your purpose a little bit more? We talked about it a, no, a little bit already. We said ask your friends what not what you're good at. But um, tell me a little bit more about what that means to you. So I am, being a 26th year in practice, I am more willing and able to give myself to other chiropractors to help them out now. Okay. Than I had ever than I had ever done before, and so be willing. First of all, with the accessibility of vast media now, and the ability to communicate with people from Collingwood, Canada, Ontario, to Cortland, New York, and we can do this. And you and I have communicated numbers of times over over a decade, and the ability to communicate so easily with people and connect with people is such so easy. Find people who will help you. Um, and if it's not me, find someone else. And so I coach with, coach with docs all the time and I don't, I don't do it for any, any fee. I do it because I have a certain, you know, what's that, uh, Liam Neeson. I have, I have a certain set of skills or, you know, particular mm -hmm. set of skills, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I do. I help people out, ask people, feel free to ask people. And I'm sure if someone came to you and said, can I, can I take 10 minutes of your time? You would say, yeah, how about we do 30 minutes just so we can cover everything? Mm -hmm. And being able to do that and just being able to light another fire on someone else, um, it, it's it's really it's an opportunity that you should be able to take. And you know, your state associations or something, find somebody along the way um, in any group you want to have and, and find that person, ask and ask, and then reinforce it with knowledge. Yeah, find your tribe and then and then look to people to support you uh, because it can get really lonely sometimes for docs. I know depending on and we have yeah a lot of social media groups and there's this, you know things that you can connect ways that you can connect with people. But some docs can still feel very alone if they haven't found the right people to to support them and help them feel connected and that they're validated in what they're doing in their practice. Yeah, you know, uh, and you look at you're absolutely correct. So you look at at practices. And we all think that we are all alone in the world. And, and we're not. Here's a common, commonality. is that One is that we're all chiropractors. Yeah, well, oh, there's a great start. Two is we've all went through that, the, um, uh, you know, the boot camp that we called chiropractic college. And then mm -hmm. we all had to start in practice. And then we're all looking at this, this and saying, hey, well, we have nothing in common because, well, you're down the road from me or you're down – uh, the interstate from me, it's like, no, we're all connected. We're all connected, especially with with the ease of ability of, of communication now that uh, we can we can reach out to people. And you are absolutely correct saying find your tribe because it is nice to know that you had, you know, I call it finding your gang. You know, you got a mm -hmm. gang with you and it's and practices, pra it doesn't necessarily pe practice get better immediately, but it's better when you have someone you can just chat with and it's just find those people. And mm -hmm. by the way, they're out there. They're out there. I'm on two, 
I'm on I'm on two two accountability groups, and um, I never I've never met any of those people face to face. Awesome, that's a really special thing. I've been on a mastermind, you know, weekly call group for six years, and uh, it's a valuable valuable part of my week. That's for sure. So, you know, when you talk about connecting with so many different docs and people that you've coached or, you know, or mentored or just had conversations with, would you say there's a common um, concern or challenge or theme that comes up that you end up talking, uh, talking these docs through or giving them some support on? Like, is there a central for, theme that you're feeling? For me, um, it always comes down to the communication mm -hmm. and the, the ease and the ability to communicate with your practice member on a regular basis about chiropractic and why they should be under your care, Melissa. And people get really, really stuck on what to do. Uh, I spoke with a young guy who was starting practice, and I, I asked him, how long, how long do you think people usually see you? He says, yeah, well, maybe around 10 adjustments. I said, how long do you think they should? And he said, well, I think it should be for life. I said, so what's your communication with them that allows them to stay around that long? And he kind of looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, what are you saying to them that would allow them to be in your practice for longer? And he said, I, I really have no idea. I said, so, okay, here's your homework. Go home and write, write 72 visits worth, 72 adjustments worth of things to say to people. And he said, I said, it's not going to take, I mean, it's not going to be a 10 minute thing. It might be a weekend, couple weekend thing. I said, here's your thing. Here's your script. This is your script. You're going to say for 72, it, cause it changes the way you think if you have 72 adjustments ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't going to be saying, okay, let's talk about this each day. You know, let's talk about getting you out of pain today. It's, and people talk to me about their pain every single day. Awesome. Awesome. But it, for me, it always comes down to communication because, once again, if you are unwilling or unable to tell the story of chiropractic, you will have a tough time in practice. I don't care what technique you have. I don't care what science you have. I don't care what, what technology you have behind you. If you're unwilling to tell the story of why someone should be under your care, you're going to have a tough time in practice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having said that, you know, what docs should be doing while they're in practice or communicating, do you think there's a mistake that you feel is quite, quite common that docs make when they are trying to communicate a chiropractic? They don't, they don't, they don't tell what they really believe. They're afraid that someone's going to leave their practice if they tell them it's okay to, um, if they talk about just the aches and pains. Um, they're afraid to tell people that, by the way, I think, you, I think you, Melissa should be under care for re your rest of your life. And this is why, and I correlate it along with, with you brushing your teeth, with you exercising, with you drinking great water, with you thinking great thoughts. That's all part of the chiropractic lifestyle. It's all part of the chiropractic lifestyle. We are the only doctors in the planet on the planet who talk this way. People are literally dying. They're dying to understand what we do and how we can help them and understand it's part of a whole package of stuff. And docs sell themselves so short on that. Um, and that's where it really, really, they have a tough time really expressing what they feel. So you think it's fear or lack of confidence or maybe a combination of both? It's both. Yeah. It's the combo platter, Charlie. I'll take the combo platter. <laughs> So when you talk about the things that you've done within, um, you know, your practice and, and with Mad Health and with Cairo, Cairo Rising, I'm sure at some point you've dealt with people who haven't liked what you've had to say. And whether it's just a patient who's challenged your recommendations, um, someone who's criticized something that you've said on the show or attacked, you know, some of the research you're presenting. Um, when you've had those situations where someone has opposed or challenged you, how do you get through it? Because docs are dealing with this kind of stuff in big and small ways all the time. All the time. So uh, one of the first things we do is we, we pre-qualify the new people come in our office. And how do I do that? So every person who calls my office, we pre-qualify my, my staff the, who answers the phone. She pre-qualifies them, sends them to me. I then talk to that person. And so I, I do no work comp. I do no Medicare. I do no personal injury. And so those people, if they want to stay in that realm, then I recommend them someplace else. And I do that because I, I really don't want to work with those people. If you are someone who calls up and says, hi, um, 
Uh, I just tweaked my back yesterday. I just want to come in for a quick adjustment. How about that? I recommend them someplace else. I want the I want so I want my target market, my ideal clients. I work hard for those people. I work very very hard for those people, and so that's the first thing. And so I don't have people who who want uh, you know one and done. I I don't have them in my right. Practice so you're not dealing I, with people challenging your recommendations because you you kill that monster so to speak before it even happens, right? Like you take care of it before it even comes into your practice. It's an offensive move that you make. Yeah. So when's the best time to kill the monster before it becomes a monster? Yeah. And that's, so that's the first thing. The second of all is, uh, has there been any time during my practice, 26 years, in which people have challenged me uh, upon anything that I've done? Well, ab- absolutely, man. It's, it's for, of, of course they have. I mean, it's just normal. But so I always look at them asking that question. Um, when they say, for instance, chiropractic can't help with, and add in whatever it is. And so I stopped, I, I stopped that right away. And and I, so I reposition that as they're asking me the question, can, can chiropractic help with that? Can chiropractic help with that? And since now I start to formulate my answer to that. And so we start with there. And so I never see it as someone denying what we do. I see it as them always inquiring as how we can help them. And once you start, once you reposition that, it's a whole different, other it's a whole different other conversation. The other thing is this, is that when I'm on Facebook, on YouTube, on one of the sites, podcasts, and people challenge some of the research, my answer is, are you freaking kidding me, you freaking jackhammer? How are you freaking, <laughs> how are you going to be, you're going to be challenging me on research? You're telling me we're not research-based. I just gave you refereed research from from references and right there. Don't be a freaking jackhammer. You know, that. just read this stuff. I can understand where you don't want us where your your ideology is that chiropractic is this is this, okay, and then I move on. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to love the people we love, and the people who are going to hate you. Let them go. Just let them go. Don't waste your time. And especially, please, listeners, don't be freaking arguing with people on Facebook. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, it can it can take you down a rabbit hole of. Uh frustration and anger and suck up way too much time on, on negativity and things that you don't really want to engage in. Right. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? How do you define, um, for when you think of what a successful life looks like for, for auto, how would you summarize that for yourself? What makes you feel successful? Uh, being able to get up every single day and do something I love and look forward to it. Being able to be surrounded by people that you want to spend time with and being able to have the access to uh, the fun things that you want to be able to do. And none of that costs money, by the way, none of that costs money. Um, a great night, a great night would be sitting down and just laughing with my friends. I mean, literally just laughing with friends and telling, probably telling the same stories we told last week, but you know, but better. And with some killer Um, tunes on probably, right? Probably, um, by the way, let me play one for you. Right <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but you know, that's, that's really, it's, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lone wolf a lot of the time and I prefer it that way when I'm, I'm private, but I love being around my family. So a lot of family, my close friends. And so for that, whatever they want to do, I'm good with that. Well, I think it's important for people to get clear on what a successful life looks like for us as individuals, right? So how Melissa defines success, how Otto defines success, you know, what are the things that you want in, in life? And obviously, we all want successful practices and the ability to, to help people, but how we do that can be unique. And it's important to not forget that there are people in our lives that in addition to being doctors, we're parents and we're friends and we're partners and we're daughters and, you know we play all these other roles that can give us our lives a lot of meaning and making time for them is, is crucial. A- absolutely. And so I, I just, I was asked a short, I did a talk uh, a while ago on the philosophy of success and uh, the philosophy of money in chiropractic. And I said, if you had, if you could have abundance amount of money, what would you do with it? 
And I said, so I started out the conversation with what I would do with it. The first thing is I would have every child in my community have 10 books every single year so they could read. Cause I firmly believe that if you get, get kids reading, you change that generation. So that's the first thing. Second of all is I would have any student who wants to play an instrument because once again, I think if you play an instrument, your brain works differently. You have an opportunity. And the third thing is I would pay to have my church open for as long as possible. And I said, but here's the reality. I can't do that without money. And I can't do have the money without unless my practice is successful. And so I go back into my practice on a regular basis so I can do all these other things. I haven't reached those three things fully yet. I have done um, lesser ways, but that's why I go to practice every day. So because that that fire still burns in me to do those three things, which, by the way, I don't care if they uh, those kids ever remember me. I don't mm-hmm. care. I don't care about that. But I do care that they have an opportunity. Well, and as you said earlier, you know, you had that moment where you realized that this is what you're good at. This is what you're here to do. And so you're doing what you are good at and what you can do every day and, and earning, um, you know, a living doing it and being able to contribute to society. What, um, what would be one thing you wish all chiropractors knew? I know, easy question, right? Because you, you tour and you speak and, you know, you have these conversations and there's lots of different ways you could interpret that. But if we had, if this is your last question of our conversation here today, um, how would you answer that? That they all have a genius within them and they should allow that, they should allow themselves the opportunity to let that genius out and put the freaking genius to work. Would you please get him to work? <laughs> uh, that, uh, that we all have special gifts and talents. Allow that and put it to work. Put it in motion, man. Put it in motion. Awesome. As my as my good friend uh, uh, would say, you plug it in, you strap it on, and you turn it up. <laughs> nice, perfect way to end this conversation here today on <laughs> Rockstar Doctor Life. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, chatting with you and and knowing you, and uh, it fires me up to see all the things that you're continuing to do uh, within chiropractic. So thank you. Dr. Melissa, it has been a pleasure to have known you, and I want to know uh, what drugs are you on because you haven't aged a freaking second since the first <laughs> time I met you. It's the chiropractic light. Well, my hair looks different. Come on, let's be real. My hair wasn't this color, I don't think, when you first met me, but uh, it's the chiropractic hmm. life, right? It's, you know, you eat well, you take care of your body, you get adjusted regularly, I get enough sleep most of the time, and surrounded by people that I love and work that I love to do. And, and that's the recipe for, I think, a healthy life for all of us. We're all cooks, aren't we? We're all chefs. <laughs>